everyone, and welcome to another episode of In the Studio. I'm Lynn Weaver, and my guest today is Professor Sharon Rangana. He is the director of the UC Davis um, program of memory and plasticity map within the Center of Neuroscience, and he's also a professor of, in the Department of Psychology. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Lynn. Thank you for coming. And uh, our topic today is going to be memory and the secret world of memory. And memory is who we are. And as you may know, the uh, French 19th century novelist Marcel Proust discovered the power of memory when he tasted his famous cookie. Yes. And after that, he published a long series of psychological novels, very long novels. So here we are. Well, Professor Rangana is a prominent researcher in the vast and complex field of the brain. And so when I was preparing for this interview, I began to read about what he does. And I was spellbound. And I quote, our research involves the use of functional neuroimaging, scalp and intracranial electroencephalography to study the neural basis of human memory and executive control, etc., etc., etc. I hope you're going to make it a little more easy for us. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Good. Definitely. I should probably rewrite that <laughs> web page. Oh, it sounds wonderful. Very mysterious. Yeah. Um, very secret, you know. It's very a secret. secret. World of memory, yes. So. so what would you say are some of the, uh, the most interesting advances in the study of memory at the, at the moment? Remember, yeah. we are lay people here. Oh, no, that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. Um, uh, you know, I think probably the biggest advance is, you know, it's a very exciting time to be studying memory because we have new technologies that allow us to get in the brain and we have methods to kind of identify what people are remembering at a given time. And so there's been this convergence of studies in humans and studies from animals that are allowing us to break down what it, a memory even is, right? Because yes. you can remember something in terms of being able to see someone's face and be able to go, I've seen this person before. Or you can remember something in terms of, say, going back to, you know, Proust cookie kind of thing where you have something that just takes you back to a particular time and place. And it's just so powerful, it, isn't it? And it's vivid and you re-experience yes. all the stuff. It's like you get the sensory information, the sights and the sounds, yes. you know, yes. the smells especially. You know. Smells, yes. 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 And so that's all, if you think about it, that's so many different parts of the brain that are processing so many different kinds of information yes. that we're now just starting to figure out, okay, how does the brain file all of those different kinds of information and how are they linked together? And so we have techniques, uh, some of which are a little bit simpler, but some of them are also more complex using things like machine learning, yes. where we can image people's brain activity, say, while they're watching a movie. Yes. And then we can identify while people are just remembering the movie, we can say, ah, this is essentially what's happening in the brain as people call up that memory. And what's amazing is, is that you can find brain areas that, you know, across, you know, let's say if you remember this interview later, it's going to be probably a 15 minute interview. Yes. And if somebody asks you what happened, it might take you two or three minutes to recall what happened. Or more. And, <laughs> um, maybe, yes. Will it help if I show uh, one of the uh, pictures? Absolutely. Uh, and maybe you can expand a little bit about where memory is uh, functioning, or at least that's what I would like to. Just. Yes, absolutely. So absolutely. So if we can show this, uh, this is a nice brain. <laughs> <laughs> it's schematic, of course. Yes. Yes. Well, Tell actually, this it. is a real brain, but what we oh, did it with is. it, it is a real brain, but oh. what we do is we can use software to say, because if you imagine the brain's like, imagine it's like a football that was deflated and all crinkled up. And so nice this is literally, image. we call it brain inflation, where we Imagine what would the look, brain look like if we could puff it up with air and make it all look, uh, you know, completely flat. And this is puffed it up. This yes. is puffed up. And so you're yeah. looking at the middle of the brain here. Yeah. And so what you can see is that there's areas both, uh, one area is kind of 
deep in the middle of the temporal lobe yes. called the hippocampus. Yes. And there's other areas uh, that you can see, the bright areas kind of towards the back middle. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's er those are areas in the parietal lobes. Mm -hmm. And so these areas in the parietal lobes are very interesting because, as I was saying before, if you watch a movie or you do this interview, what you'll find is, is that you tend to break it up into little segments, right? Yes. You might go, okay, we yes. started off with the introduction and now we're doing the photo tour and so forth, right? Yes. And so you can actually see these patterns of the brain saying, hey, here's event number one, here's event number two, here's event number three. And when you people recall it. Them. What? You catalog them That's in right. your brain. That's right. And we sort of, uh, it's called, uh, we segment them too. Mm, so segment. even though, if you think about our life, it's a continuous timeline, right? But when you remember things, you don't remember it like that. You sort of break it up into things that happen at particular chunks of time and space. You yes. Know? Well, the, this is uh, very interesting. Let's uh, let's show another image uh, that uh, perhaps. Oh, this is you. It's mm. a nice picture <laughs> with a very nice uh, hat there. You've. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, so this is this is uh, usually there's very smart people in my lab who do that kind of work uh, with me. Yes. Uh, but this is just a picture of me doing it. We're doing what's called electroencephalography, which yes. you also read about on yes. the website. Except that you pronounce it properly. <laughs> oh, you did fine. You did fine, Larry. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, electroencephalography is a way to measure electrical activity in the yeah. brain. Because if and you think map that, it a little bit. Uh, and map it, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not that great for figuring out exactly where it's coming from, but it gives you information in the millisecond range in real mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, in just, let's say, one-tenth of a second, your brain is volleying back all of these different kinds Amazing. of signals. And Amazing. what's really interesting is, you know, if you see a performance and everyone starts clapping, you notice within about a second or so, everybody's clapping in sync, right? Yes. You don't just hear, you know, it's like everybody gets into a rhythm. Oh, that's very and, interesting. And that's how people naturally interact with each other. And mm -hmm. so you can see these kinds of rhythms and brain activity, too, if you record electrical brain activity. And so we call those oscillations. But they're basically rhythms that are showing how brain regions are interacting with each other. And so this method is really good for getting at that because one of the things we found um, that I'll show you a little later is yes. that you can actually try to stimulate those brain rhythms and oh, improve memory. Yes, well, the, this is, uh, uh, this leads me to uh, my next question. And, uh, but before I do that, um, you mentioned tools, better tools. Yes. Now. Can you give me an example of one tool, one being the one we just saw, yes. the, right? The encephalo. Electroencephalography. Yes. 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 And that is proving very effective at the moment? Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Electroencephalography, magnetic resonance imaging, which was the first yes. thing that I showed. Yes. Um, in animal research, one of the, uh, I should add yes. that there's a big movement towards integrating these techniques with advances in machine learning and computational modeling, yes. where the idea is to say, you know, the brain's a complicated place. We've got all of this different thing, yes. these things happening at a very fine time scale. Yes. And so a computer model can help make sense of all that information and sort of act as an interpreter between what we think people are remembering and what we're seeing in the brain. So and the, and uh, the Center for Neuroscience is the perfect uh, place to be because of all the interdisciplinary contribution that it receives from so many uh, team member and, and experts in, in various aspects of this. It's probably the only way to crack uh, some of the, the things that you're studying. So that's very good. Let's go to the next image. And uh, uh, um, this is another, well, actually, um, we must point out this is actually a, a GIF, so, but uh, we aren't able to rotate it at this <laughs> moment. So it's okay because uh, it, we can see all the nice colors. Yeah, people might get motion sickness anyway. So. <laughs> 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 yes, that's right. That's one risk. So what type of, uh, what, what are you showing here? So th this is an example of what's called diffusion tensor imaging. Yes. And so this is, again, a real brain, but we've done some funny stuff with it. So what we did is we use this technique to understand what the white matter looks like in the brain, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. normally people talk about the brain as if this kind of information is done here and this thing is done here. 
<laughs> but the brain's a connected network. So just like you have social networks where you interact with people, yes, um, the brain is like this too. You have brain regions that are talking to each other. Yes. And the white matter is like the telephone lines that are connecting different brain areas together. I see, yes. And so one of the things that we're starting to realize is the integrity of that white matter is very important. And so yes. You can be somebody who doesn't even have Alzheimer's disease. You can be somebody who just has diabetes, let's say. Mm -hmm. And they have tiny little uh, events, probably tiny strokes, that affect the integrity of that white matter. And so imagine if you start snipping the telephone lines, brain areas can't talk to each other. And they can't produce those kind of rhythms that mm -hmm. I was telling you about before. Mm -hmm. and Is so, that curable? It, uh, you don't want it to happen to you. We don't know mm -hmm. how reversible it is, but most likely once you lose those connections, you probably don't, don't get them back. Don't, don't. Yeah, there, Even I, though, I should say there is some evidence mm -hmm. that when you learn something new, that you can get changes in the white matter. And it's not mm -hmm. clear whether that's forming new pathways or if it's just something that's, right. that's a strengthening of an existing pathway. So I, I think it's still unclear. It's still unclear. And uh, so, um, do you think that the healthy aging process affects the way memory works, or at least uh, how powerful is memory? It depends from individual mm -hmm. to individual, of course, but uh, what would you say is a healthy aging process of memory? Well, so, I mean, you really nailed it that it varies a lot from individual yes. to individual. So if we take a group of UC Davis undergraduates and compare them to a group of you know yeah. uh, UC Davis graduates who are in their 60s, yes. the variability amongst those people in their 60s is much, much higher. Mm. And so part of the reason, you know, we're still trying to understand what makes people's memory different from each other. And so in fact, the white matter imaging that I was showing you is part of our, one of our projects to try to understand why and how people vary. Um, in general, mm -hmm. as people get older, if you're perfectly healthy, you'll still generally say my memory is not as good as it of used course, to be. Of course, yes. But um, usually, what you find is is that people often it's kind of like, you know, my office gets messier and messier as I get more and more jobs to do, <laughs> and I have trouble finding things, you know. And some to some so extent, there are that's what happens. So circumstantial uh, factors that influence your memory because if you had only one piece of paper on your desk you would find it, no problem. Right? That's right, yes, yeah. yeah. And yeah. of course there are also changes in the brain that happen even over the course of healthy yeah. aging. Yeah, but yeah. It's, uh, um, but those changes can be you know, very small or very large depending on, on, the, person. The, on the person, yeah, and, yes. and their lifestyle. And the lifestyle, of course. And also, um, there was recently I read uh, that uh, one experiment they're trying to do, and I'm sorry I can't um, uh, remember the source, but... <laughs> um, that, that's okay, that's, that's normal. Uh, is it normal? Uh, good, I'm glad. Um, that uh, for sufferers of PTSD, oh, yeah. there is a new approach to um, modify or manipulate, if mm -hmm. you like, the memories. Have you, of course, you've heard about it, and you're probably studying it. Yes, too. yeah. We're yeah. not studying PTSD in our lab. Per se. Per yeah. se. But the broader thing that you're talking about is, again, another one of the breakthroughs that people have had in our field recently. So it used to be, and many people still think this, that when you recall an event, it's like you push play on the memory. You know, it's like that's you right. Song like a your... little button there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And what we now know is, is that when you push that button, you're both pushing play and record at the same time. Oh, how very interesting. Yes, Explain. That's right. So basically <laughs> when you reactivate a memory for a past event, you go back and you remember you know, um, yeah. your 16th birthday or something like that. It's like you've opened up this little box where your memory is. Yeah. And now what can happen is, is that you can strengthen that memory and just increase the amount of stuff in that box. You could also, though, end up, you know, somebody could be talking to you and the things that they're saying could be incorporated into that memory, in which case it becomes a little distorted. Uh, you could also become distracted, and that could potentially, some people argue, will make it less accessible in the future. So when you open up a memory, all sorts of things happen. Well, that is very interesting because it makes me think of um, um, testimonies. That's right. In the court. 
you know, how reliable are they, yes. you know? And before DNA or whatever, you know, people were accused uh, on the basis of someone's testimony. So would you say that there is a way to um, improve uh, the understanding of how this works and how we enrich or, you know, deprive the memory? Yes, absolutely. So mm -hmm. one of the things with eyewitness testimony, for instance, is that uh, people will often recall something, but they can get, they're vulnerable to suggestions. So yeah. And biases, prejudices as well. As well, that's right. Yes. That's right. And, sometimes, and what happens is when you remember something, it's like your brain's being a little detective and it's trying to put together the clues and give you a little story about what happened, right? Yes. And sometimes, like you said, those prejudices can come into play, but also that opening of the box that I talked about. Can I come like into play. the idea of the box. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and and it's, so there are many cases where well-intentioned law enforcement, for instance, would ask people questions, and they would feed them the answers. You know, and they would say, "Do you remember putting oh, yes. the gun in the cabinet or something?" Yes. Yes. And what happens is, is that people, especially when they're stressed out and if you, they've undergone trauma, for instance, it's Yes. Uh, it can be even more likely that they could start to get confused yes. between what people told them and what actually happened. And they open up the box and they put in this other yeah. stuff in it. I'm afraid our time is up. Oh, no. Uh, 15 minutes go so fast That's when right. it's interesting. And uh, we've only scratched the very surface. So I hope we'll be able to have you back. I would love to. Uh, and talk a little more about special areas. But. Uh, at the moment, thank you so much, Professor Ranganar, for taking the time. It's all so fascinating. And thank you all for watching. Um, if you like uh, this episode, you can watch it again by streaming it on our website at DCT, uh, dct.davismedia.org and uh, check out some of our other programs. We have a lot of interesting people and topics uh, for you and from all of us here thank you and see you next time and thank you professor ranganar oh thank you lynn for having me look forward to coming back thank you